Uh, hello, members. Uh, just call this meeting uh, to order. Um, before I do the, the full welcome, can I get an adoption of the agenda? Susie Dillon. So welcome everyone here, and um, thanks to our, our presenters for coming, of course. Um, maybe, maybe I'll just do a, a quick introduction to make sure everybody knows who's here. Alyssa McCacken is our, our super clerk, and of course we've got uh, uh, Robbie Henderson and Gordon McNeely and Carla Bernard, Peter Bevan Baker, Robin Croucher, Susie Dillon, and I think uh, most of us have seen you around one way or another. Uh, you guys have been big on the scene with early learning and child care for many years and have done great work and so it's really nice to have you here today. But maybe what I'll do is get you to introduce yourself and your position into the mic. Uh, that way we get it on the official Hansard and they know exactly where you're at. Sonia Hooper, Assistant Deputy Minister, early years with Department of Education and early years. And Doreen Gillis, Director of Early Childhood Development with the Department of Education in Early Years. All right, well, thank you. So um, what I'd like to do is just turn the floor over to you and you can make uh, your opening presentation. And we typically hold our questions to the end, if, if that's okay with you, and then we'll uh, go into questions. Go Great, ahead. thank you. Well, it's a, it's a privilege to be here. We appreciate the invitation to come and discuss the demands on capacity and the response to the demand as we grow our system. We'll start by um, talking about some, some stats and facts. Um, we'll talk about our space growth, EYC designation and funding, and then have a look at what's next. So research informs our work, and this is just one example of a recent um, report Friendly and McDonald have published a number of months ago. And despite the number of families still waiting um, for a licensed childcare space, PEI continues to show a high rate of availability of childcare in comparison with other provinces and territories. And McDonald and Friendly would indicate in this report that it's not new. PEI topped all other jurisdictions for the percentage of children aged 0 to 5 for whom there was a regulated space in a centre back as far as 1992. The same authors have studied the phenomena of child care deserts across Canada. This is defined by postal code and indicates that there are three or more children in that particular geographic area for every one child care space. In their 2023 report, they noted that across Canada, PEI has the fewest percentage of children who live in a child care desert. And that when studying access in major cities, Charlottetown shows enough childcare capacity to cover 72% of children younger than kindergarten age, making Charlottetown the second best city in the country on this metric. We'll talk about how there's still more work to do, though, as we, as we carry on our presentation. <laughs> So another recent um, report that was released by Statistics Canada was the Survey on Early Learning and Child Care Arrangements, or the SELCA, and the Canadian Survey on Early Learning and Child Care. While the results do show on the surface a decrease in the proportion of children on PEI participating in child care from 2019 to 2023, after meeting with our colleagues at Statistics Canada, they have noted that these results can't really be generalized in that way as it leaves out some very important contextual information. So this, this table shows <clears throat> the surveys measured the use of any type of childcare arrangement. So that includes grandparents, unlicensed, licensed. So when you click a little deeper um, and customize the results, this table pictured here shows an increase in the use of center-based childcare arrangements on PEI from 3,600 children in 2019, <clears throat> sorry, to 3,900 children in 2023. Another tool that we use in our work is the Early Learning and Child Care Registry. It was developed back in 2010 and has seen several improvements since that, since that time. The system was built with families in mind to create an order orderly and electronic waiting line. One that will self-correct as families find a space and decide to come off the registry or as an account becomes inactive. When reporting the system strips away duplicates, as you can imagine, most waiting lists would have the same children on each waiting list. 
as well reporting strips away those that choose to continue to wait on the list even after they've found a space. The most recent data is accurate, however, we did have, have a question regarding the spike in numbers in August 2023, which you can see on the, uh, on the table. And we asked ECDA to take a second look at this data. They have determined that the spiked numbers were actually a technical error. The error was immediately pinpointed and fixed before the next report. We have requested the ECDA to provide further details on, <coughs> on the data, <coughs> the technical error, and their subsequent system upgrade. Uh, however, I don't have those details today. ECDA does perform, though, regular um, check-ins with directors on the operations of the registry and applies updates and improvements to the system as identified or as needed. Often the question is how many children are on the registry? It's a really complicated question because the registry lists um, those waiting by region, by age. So are you asking this question just generally or specifically to an age group or a particular geographic region. Uh, the table above is for those that have identified looking for care immediately. Um, and I say identified looking for care immediately because they could be in um, an unlicensed child care provision situation currently, but they're still on the registry for this licensed care. So we are working as a division to modernize our data collection ability and of course the registry becomes part of these conversations and future priorities. However, in the meantime, the ECDA does, um, does a great job responding to any issues and system changes as they are needed. In fact, a number of years ago a parent came forward to share their story of being accepted into a centre and that centre wasn't meeting in particular this family's needs. So they wanted to stay on the registry, and at that time, many years ago, that was not an option. Once they were accepted into a centre, they automatically came off the registry. But after that conversation, it was viewed as in very important that parental choice be the top priority, so parents now can choose to stay on the registry. Another example of when a family would use that choice would be if they accepted a, a centre that came up on the registry, but it's outside of their community, and they decide to stay on in case one comes up in their community so then they, they can reduce their drive time or what have you. Um, so it made good sense to prioritize parental choice um, and leave this option available on the registry. Does it make for a few extra calls for directors that they have to skip over these that are waiting? Probably, but parental choice was deemed as, as the most important. Okay, so um, another tool that really supports system growth of the early learning and child care system in PEI is our Early Learning and Child Care Act and regulations. And we've recently had some um, amendments to our regulations, and uh, those changes came into effect on December 31st of 2023, so very, very recent. We started our consultation with the Early Learning and Child Care System back in February of 2022. So worked um, with the system with our proposed changes till we got to a place where everybody felt comfortable with what was being proposed and um, happy to say that they are now in, in effect. So three areas that I wanted to talk about were uh, the capacity, the infant group size, and certification. So capacity has changed. Previous to, these, uh, to the regulatory amendments, the maximum capacity for an early learning and child care centre was 80. That has now changed to 125. So that would be for currently licensed early childhood centers where they did have the square footage to make that change to the higher number of children or for any new applicants. Um, if they're looking at space or looking to build, then they can look to a maximum of 125 children. Another area is on infant group size. So previous to the changes, the maximum group size for infants was six. So what that meant was that in any one room, you could have no more than six children, or six infants, no matter what the size of the room. And we do have some early learning and child care centers who have you know, nice big areas for their infants and have the uh, square footage to go 
in a group size higher than six. But our regulations really cap that at six. And so they would have to go with a second room or a second group of six infants if they wanted to go above six. So our changes are that we can now have a maximum group size of 12 infants. Now there are some other um, regulatory changes that, that have been put in place to ensure that we're paying attention to the quality for the infants that are in those groups. And so there's an, um, a requirement that if you are going to have more than six infants in a room, then the square footage requirement has increased from 3.5 square meters to four square meters per child. That's because there's gonna be additional um, adults in that room as well. So we wanna ensure that there is enough space for children to be able to engage in that environment in an appropriate way. And that's really paying attention to the quality. So there are some centers um, that, that do have the square footage already to make, to make that change to a larger than six group size, and, and they are doing so. But this is really helpful for any centers who maybe want to look at renovating their space or for anybody who is looking for new space, so a new build, for example. They're able to build for a group size of 12 for infants rather than that, that previous group size of six. The next area that really is uh, making a contribution to the early learning and child care system and PEI is the changes that we have made to the certification titles. So uh, previous uh, to, to the changes in December, we had a number of different levels of certification. And uh, one of the recommendations that we had in an earlier report from, uh, from Kathleen Flanagan was for us to look at uh, the number of certification levels we had and to see how we could streamline that. And so we met with the sector a lot over the last year and a half and worked with them to get to a place with certification titles where they felt comfortable with what we were proposing for the new certification titles. And we did eliminate um, a, a couple of those, uh, of those certification levels that we previously held. So now we have um, early childhood intern, which is the same as our e previous ECE1. But what is new is the next level. It's an early childhood associate level. And with the early childhood associate level, this would be for individuals who are certified with a one year, who have uh, finished a one year credential in early learning and child care. So our previous ECE2 level cert certificate holders, they, they fit into this category. But this also has created a new pathway for certification for individuals who have completed a cre credential in human services or human studies. And so if you have a diploma or degree in human services or studies, you're able to now apply for certification at the early childhood associate level. And why this is important is it uh, opens up opportunity for these individuals to now come onto our early our wage grid. And so um, they can become certified at the associate level and find themselves at a higher place on the wage grid where previously they would have been at the uncertified level. And then our third level of certification that we have is the early childhood educator. And this is for individuals who have a, a two-year diploma in early learning and child care or a post-diploma or degree in early learning and child care. And it was really important when we did our consultations, what we, we heard very strongly from, uh, from those working in our system was that ownership of the title of early childhood educator. And that really started when you have that minimum level of, sort of, a, of a credential at the diploma level. So this level of certification begins at the early childhood educator diploma level and then the post-diploma and degree level. Outside of our Early Learning and Child Care Act and regulations, um, one thing that we wanted to mention was some changes that we've made to our division structure. And this is important because it allows us to respond more effectively and efficiently to individuals who are asking questions about becoming licensed to um, who want to meet with, with our team um, to find out about the licensing process or to have us come out and look at some space. And so what we have uh, created is an 
uh, a new section in the early years division. And that was effective uh, this September 2023. And that section is provides licensing support. So it's the uh, licensing and compliance section within our early years division. So this slide here just shows you, um, it's, it's a graphic to demonstrate the growth of early learning and childcare spaces from 2018 to 2023. We're working hard um, both provincially and with our federal uh, partners to expand access to licensed early learning and childcare across PEI, licensed affordable early learning and childcare. So despite how we opened, Sonia uh, talked earlier about a slide that um, showed that a report indicated that PEI is doing pretty good with coverage when you compare us to the rest of the country. However, we know we still have work to do and we do still need to be growing spaces and opening up access for more families across PEI. The focus for growth really um, at this point is infants and toddlers. We know that uh, we need to, to grow the infant and toddler spaces across PEI. And I'm happy to say that uh, since April of 2023, in our newly licensed spaces, 76% of those newly licensed spaces are for infants and toddlers. Another shift is um, with centers who are able to open up more infant spaces without actually increasing their license center numbers. So they may not need more spaces overall, but they're using their spaces differently so that they can open up more infant spaces within their center. And so that is happening as well. I'll go ahead, Gord. Yeah, if you want to just jump in, if it's a clarification sort of question. Does that, if you're adding infant spaces to current spaces, um, doesn't that take away from the other areas? Yeah, so that would happen in a center where, for example, let's say they're licensed for 50 children. And just as an example, maybe they have three infants in their program. But what they're finding is that um, spaces on the preschool side are not being utilized. And so they may have a vacancy of three spaces um, within their program pretty consistently. So they're making that shift to uh, have those spaces become infant spaces, which we know is going, they're going, those spaces are going to fill very quickly. And then there's still the space within the two to, to school entry um, license spaces for those infants to move into. Thanks for that clarification. Yes. So again, another slide just on our license spaces, but what I want to draw attention to here is the, um, is the shift in actual uh, number of licensed centers from 2018 to now. And so we have seen an increase in our number of designated early year centers. So in 2018, we had 50 designated early year center and we now have 76. This is opening up spaces that of course are more affordable for families as well. Because of our publicly managed system, designated early year centers are part of that publicly managed system. And our publicly managed system is where the parent fees are decreasing right now to $10 a day. So it's opening up more affordable spaces. There has been a decrease in the number of non-designated early childhood centers. And this really makes sense because as we increase the number of designated early year centers, those centers that are operating in as a non-designated are decreasing. And we really are working um, to ensure that we have opportunity for every non-designated center that wishes to become an early year center, that they have opportunity to apply um, to go through that process. Family home centers we've increased. So from 2018, we had three, we now have 16, and we continue to, uh, to work with individuals who are interested in becoming licensed in that realm. Preschool centers, this is a one area where we are seeing a decrease in the number of preschool centers. So the preschool centers category of license where um, they operate for no more than four consecutive hours. So it's really that half day program. In 2018, we had 10 preschool centers where now we now have seven. So what we're noticing is that as parent fees are decreasing, 
the demand for full day spaces is increasing. So the demand for those half day spaces, um, we're not seeing that same demand that we may have seen um, a number of years ago as parent fees decrease. And then our school age centers um, have moved from 55 to 61. Sorry, I'm not doing very good job. That's okay. <laughs> so just uh, a little more information about school age centers. So as I mentioned, there are currently 61 school age licenses across PEI and early learning and child care licenses are approved by the Early Learning and Child Care Board. Um, this represents a license capacity of 2,451 spaces across PEI. Now, school-age childcare is really delivered in a variety of program types and um, in a variety of, of, of uh, facilities. So we may have centers that are operated by a municipality, some are not-for-profit organizations, some are private operators. They would operate um, potentially out, we have out of schools, could be out of community centers, um, and, um, and as well as, as churches. So a number of different varieties of ways that centers are operating. Um, and so we recognize that there is growing pressures related to school age child care. And we're going to talk about this further a little later on in the presentation. However, we just wanted to provide you with a snapshot of what school age childcare currently looks like across PEI. So what we do know is there's no one solution to system growth. And we've had a number of initiatives over the past number of years that really have supported system growth across the island. One of those initiatives was expansion grants. And so that was through our Canada-wide funding. We were able to provide these expansion grants. And there really are a, a micro grant, so a, a smaller grant that would allow centers who maybe needed to make minor renovations to their environment or to purchase equipment um, this would allow them to do that so that they could apply for um, a higher license number and increase the license spaces across the island. We really feel we've, we've uh, reached a point though where we've saturated that, that, um, that uh, area of growth. Those that were able to do so more easily with those expansion grants have done so or are in the process of, of doing so. So Sonia's going to talk a little uh, further on about some of uh, the areas that we are looking to, to move into or have moved into already. So last spring, the province announced that over 300 spaces would become operational over the next 18 months. Um, this, at this point, we've had about 80 new spaces since April of 2023. And as I mentioned, 76% of those are infant and toddler spaces. What we know is that during the, the, the period of time between last April and now, operators are still facing some supply issue ch uh, challenges. So issues with um, uh, getting equipment and materials that, that they need, and also some uh, timeline delays with um, getting construction in place and having that, those renovations completed. So centers are still faced with those, with those challenges. We are um, very confident though that over, we had said over 18 months that these spaces would become operational and we're still confident that we're on track to have that, um, to have those spaces become operational within that time frame. And the other the piece of information that centers were waiting on was for that increase in capacity from the maximum of 80 to 125. And so that now that that's in place, we are, again, we're confident that we're going to reach that goal for spaces. Family home centre growth, um, so we have grants in place to increase the number of licensed family home centres across the province. We have a capital grant where 
individuals who are interested in becoming licensed and licensed and are starting that licensing process, they can apply for a capital grant. This would allow them to complete some renovations that may be required for them to meet licensing requirements. So for example, they may need to put up a, a, a fence in their backyard in order to meet a, a licensing requirement. This grant would provide them with the funds to, to, have, to do that. We also have an operational grant, and the operational grant is for those who become licensed. And this is to support the decrease in parent fees to our publicly managed parent fee numbers, which right now are at uh, our amounts that right now are at $10. Um, it also provides them with some funding just to support them with the operations of their family home center. This grant was at $15,000 for this year, and it increased to $30,000 in November, recognizing that the parent fees were decreasing to $10 in January. And so we know that we, uh, we have some work to do on this operational grant, and we had a family home center focus group that happened uh, just a couple of weeks ago. And we had great turnout for that focus group, and great discussion. We're in the process now of compiling that information and we will be using the feedback from that focus group to inform our next steps for the operational grant, for example. And now over to Sonia. So as Doreen shared the numbers on EYC designation, um, it's now becoming um, the majority of our centers rather than the minority of our centers. So it's more the norm, so to speak. Um, so it makes great sense to evaluate the application process for EYC designation. And this uh, conversation has been on the table for many years. I know years ago ECDA uh, was advocating for, for this as well, um, but we're proud to say that we're now at a place where it makes sense to move with continuous intake for EYC applications. So I think everybody is familiar with EYC designations, so just sort of overview. Um, the standards are higher than, than just basic licensing standards. It's attached to funding um, that supports the provincial wage grid and then the commitment to charge um, the per provincial parent fees, which are $10 a day currently. So with all of that, we want people to be interested in coming forward to open new centers. So in order to do that, um, there does need to be this opportunity for early years designation. So in the absence of that designation, it would make it very difficult to operate a center. The, <clears throat> excuse me, the same criteria or standards will remain. Um, there'll be a probationary period to ensure that folks are able to meet or exceed those requirements. And of course, our, our well-qualified um, coaching team will work closely with these folks too to ensure a successful implementation. But needless to say, exciting news to be at this place. Um, a great deal of gratitude does need to go out to all those operators that jumped on board and didn't look back 14 years ago, and those that have jumped on since to, uh, to help build our system and uh, build a system that's talked, talked about with envy across the country. But again, not one solution. So we're also working across departments to identify usable space that could suitably be transformed into an EYC space. We're in discussions with builders to understand how we could work together with builders to create solutions for physical space. We're talking with operators um, directly to understand their needs, lease agreements and occupancy possibilities, their capital, their capital grant needs. We're working across other departments to consider su suitable spaces within capital builds. We've recently developed a suitability tool to help frame these conversations when co-locating a childcare center with other, um, other uh, entities. It, there are some additional considerations to be, to, be, um, to be looked at, so the suitability tool is, uh, is to help support those conversations. And then there's the low interest loan. Um, that was a response to industry requests and currently we have six interested parties that are in discussions with us now for those low interest loans and we're having discussions with others. Um, 
so we're happy that there's that there is interest in in looking at that part of our solutions um, again not one solution we that's why we're continuing to work um, to work with builders to work to create capital incentives to continue to consult with the industry and I do have to add that the burden of responsibility to grow our system does not lie with one centre or one group of centres. That's why we're working with everybody and we're trying to come up with a multitude of solutions that will be of interest to a multitude of operators. So of course, great news on space growth and infant spaces and so on, but all of those need early childhood educators working in those, in those spaces. So um, also working closely with post-secondary institutions to ensure um, accelerated training opportunities, both through College to Lille and Holland College. Um, the combination of graduating folks with their diploma with the full-time programs in early childhood and the accelerated programs, we're averaging about 51 graduates a year, which for little old PEI is pretty impressive. Steps to Success has been a real um, uh, success um, as a uh, earn and learn opportunity to um, enter the, the workforce. And that program actually um, is boasting 93% retention into the system. So it's been a really great um, entry program. There are online options as well through the post-secondary uh, institutions. Holland College and College de Lille both have their three entry-level courses, which would get the intern certificate, um, all available either asynchronously or synchronously. Um, and Holland College has, and I might be using the wrong word, so I apologize to Holland College, but they have a, a smart classroom that they're using as well with the accelerated training so that folks that have, um, in particular, a long drive to attend class, they can attend virtually using that classroom. Um, New Brunswick Community College and St. Lawrence College are the two other options, um, not on island, obviously, but that do have an online opportunity for students to acquire their early childhood diploma. Uh, sorry, yep, sorry. Yep. I can't see far away with them on, but I can't read without them, so sorry. <laughs> um, just curious if the, when, when you talk about an accelerated program, is this a beginner program for somebody who is just wanting to get into it, or is this somebody who's already had some and they're taking more? Okay, great question. So steps to success would be for the beginner that doesn't have any experience but is interested in checking out the career of early childhood. So they, that's uh, funded through Skills PEI and managed by ECDA, um, but it gives an earn while you learn kind of opportunity. So they get experience in a center and they'll they get their three entry level courses through so they the post secondary. Take them online, those courses they can online. take them, yeah, they can take them online. Um, absolutely. So then from there is the accelerated training. And the accelerated training is for folks that have been working in the system already for at least one year. And they can apply then to take the accelerated program. And it's offered both certificates, so that's year one or diploma year two. So a number of folks have taken their certificate, and now since it's been, this is the third year, they're now into their diploma. And that's where you get your steps for your uh, pay scale. Right. Yep, exactly. Yep. Thanks for that Thanks, clarification. So, and I do have people on, on the list with questions once the presentation is done, so thanks Great. for your patience, everybody. Um, so yeah, about 24 students are entering um, this the uh, the Steps to Success program each year. So again, it's it just it keeps it it keeps the uh, the intake um, the the wheel moving. Um, again, the program has a 93% retention rate, uh, which is pretty fantastic. Um, one of the more talked about um, supports that have been added to EYCs this past. Um, this past year, here in a bit, um, as, as part of our Canada-wide Early Learning and Child Care Agreements was the pedagogical support position. Um, Doreen will speak a little more to that. Um, we're also proud to say that we have 11 folks returned to the system through the Return to Profession grants. Um, and this is something that we're talking with colleagues all across the country um, about. 
is to learn from each other and discuss incentives on how we can attract the thousands back into the system that have have left over the years due to you know the salaries not being where they are today or working conditions etc. Um, certainly the uh, wage increase of 55 percent for the ECE3 since 2019 and the pension contributions have certainly increased the recruitment and retention efforts. Um, so I just I, I liked this picture of the wage increases because I think that um, for a long time within early learning and child care we didn't really have a career landscape. We didn't really have the opportunity to sort of see where where I might be able to go as an early childhood educator across the system and this really does show that there's progression possible um, through the through the uh, through the salary increases. In 2010, an ECE3 was looking at $15 an hour to start, and I remember talking to many of you at that time. And now today, um, to start in an ECE3 position, or what's now termed as an ECE, it would be $28.86 to start. So as we grow our early learning and childcare system, um, we need to know we need to be paying attention to the quality within our centers as well. And so for early year centers, uh, the early learning, uh, the early year center funding certainly is a, it contributes to that quality within a center. So parent fees alone are insufficient to cover the wages and operating costs of early year centers. The operational grant calculation includes factors such as the number of employees, the total cost of wages, and the number of children, children attending an early year center. Increasing wage rates or decreasing parent fee rates, so for example, the reduction to $10 a day, results in a higher grant payment from government. EYCs, in addition to EYC funding, the operational funding, EYCs are also provided separate funding grants for other programs, such as the Special Needs Assistant Grant, Early Years Autism Assistant Grant, uh, the pension plan that Sonia mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, Capital Infrastructure Grants. We also have our pre-kindergarten funding grants pedagogical support staff grant, and alternate or extended hours of operation grant. So a number of other different sources of grants that uh, earlier centers are eligible to receive um, outside of the earlier center funding grant. And I think it's important to note too that since 2011, no EYC has surrendered their license due to financial hardship. We have had one center that closed a number of years ago. Um, however, that center closed because there was decreasing enrollment. So it was at a time when there wasn't as much demand for spaces as there, there is now. We wouldn't um, likely see a center close now because of uh, low enrollment numbers. So just another slide, a graphic to demonstrate how earlier center funding has increased over the, the last number of years. So this is based on, it's an example, because each early year center um, would be different in the amount of funding they get, depending on the makeup of their center, it depends on the number of children that they have, the ages of the children, the staff that are required, and the certification levels of the staff. But this demonstrates an average size center of about 46 uh, full-time equivalent children and calculated at everybody at the ECE3 step one, so the staff that are required for um, to meet ratio at that level. And it just demonstrates how uh, government funding has increased from 2018 until now, 2023, with the $10 a day parent fee. Again, uh, the wage grid, which has seen significant uh, advances in the last number of years. And we wanted to note from this slide that the cook is on the, uh, on the wage grid, but we have heard, we have been hearing from centers that are concerned with the wage that is currently provided to cooks within their center as it sits on the wage grid. 
So this is something that, uh, that we have been discussing with, with centers, and we are certainly uh, taking forward as part of our preparations for the next fiscal year budget. And the pedagogical support position. So this is a fairly new position within our earlier centers. We're in year two of having this position available to earlier centers. And it really is a, an important position within the center because it is allowing for centers to enhance the way they are approaching um, things like mentorship within their center. Uh, observations and documentation within their center. So centers are using this position in a variety of ways. This position is a position that does not have to be counted in ratio. So they're not, they're not, it's not a position that specifically is hired to be in ratio caring for children. Centers use this position in a variety of ways, however. They may hire an individual who is doing the pedagogical leadership within the center. So the, this position is the one that is mentoring other staff within the center, maybe doing some side-by-sides with early childhood educators and doing some modeling. So that's one way that centers are utilizing the position. Another way that centers are utilizing it is they're hiring a staff person who is providing relief to somebody else within the center to, to, to uh, really do that pedagogical role within the center. So they'll go in and, and care for the children while that individual does the mentorship. And then a third way that centers are utilizing this position is hiring an individual who is relieving staff to be able to complete observations of children, do program planning, um, observations and documentation. So a variety of ways this is being used. But we are uh, very excited to be uh, in a position where we're supporting a pedagogical position within our early year centers. So what's next? Um, as our population grows and our workforce grows, enhancing diversity and inclusion is definitely a, a priority as we continue to evolve our system. Recognizing, as mentioned previously, that school-age childcare has its pressures. Um, we're undertaking a review of the current system and looking at best practices across the country and beyond to uh, find solutions to enhance this service too. There's a lot of work underway to continue to grow and support a sustainable early learning and childcare system, including addressing alternate hours solutions to address the needs of shift workers in responsible ways, Securing physical space is a priority. We are continuing to find creative solutions to ensure suitable physical space is available for EYCs to operate and to meet demands. And as Doreen shared, we've had great success with growing family home child care and will continue to work with industry to pave a way forward as this is another valued arm of, its, of the system. We also recognize the centers grow in size, so does their need for increased supports within the program. This additional support will be paramount to these programs' success, and work is well underway to create solutions that meet the needs of centers. I'll read this last slide. Thank you. I, 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 I guess that's our mic drop. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you, guys. That was that was very informative, and it's clear there's been a lot of work done since 2018 on this file, and lots of different changes and growth. And, um, we do have, I think, I just have two people on the list right now, and that's Gordon and Peter. And Susie, you want on the list too? And Carla. Okay, we got everybody on the list now. All right. Pretty much. So um, we'll start with Gordon. Go to Peter, then Susie, then Carla, then Robbie. And uh, go ahead, Gord. Thank you very much for coming in. And I know this is a, I know that there, everybody's been working hard, and I think some of the questions will be will be tough based on based on um, where we are with our with our system. I think, and and I know uh, there has been a lot of work done, but I'm looking at the what we're talking about. The the the, the plans and solutions seems a little bit vague, and I just want to go back to where we started. This presentation started with stats. 
um, knowing where we are, knowing where your clients are, which are infants, which are those are our clients and our families. Um, we don't have any way of decide or figuring out who's on what list, and we talked about it here. Or is there a central list that you that you have? that's accurate because I'm hearing some inaccuracies about the list. How do we know where our data is? Um, so, when so the registry isn't a statistical tool, but well, the names on that list would be accurate names. So I'm not sure I understand your question. Well, I mean, when you look at, when you look at last week, people, the chances came in and talked about um, various things. They had about six or seven different things. And one of their things was the registry. Um, yes. They talked about it being non-function duplications uh, out of sync at times. Um, can you speak so to that? So I did speak to that a little bit in the parental choice. So when parents register on the registry, they sign up for maybe 10 centers. When one of those centers contacts them to offer them a space, they can accept or decline. If they accept it, the parents will receive a text or an email that will ask them, do you want to still stay on the registry? Even though you've accepted your space, do you want to stay on the registry? If they say no, they're removed off the registry automatically. That's the, that's the, that's the, that's the bonus of this electronic waiting system rather than a paper list because electronically it just removes the name. If they choose to stay on the system because they want to wait for another center, then will a center perhaps encounter them on their waiting list and, and hear from a parent when they're calling? Yeah, I'm sorry, I already have a space. I'm not interested right now. Doesn't mean they're not going to be in the future. So that's that parental choice that, that had to be built into the registry so that parents have that flexibility to switch centers if they so chose when another one became available. So, yep, they do maybe have to make a, a couple of those phone calls on that list for sure. When we look at our numbers on the registry, however, those families that have a space, have accepted a space, and want to remain on the list, they're held in a separate kind of holding place. So when we get our numbers, they're not counted into the numbers of families that are requiring childcare. Duplicates and those choosing to continue to wait are stripped out. Yeah. Gord? Yeah, I mean, from your stats, and I, th I think there, there's 1,919 kids, or 1,919 kids awaiting a space. So, I mean, we, we have a major problem. Before this meeting, I think it was, I was using the number of 2,000, and, and now it's 19. So that's, that's a lot of families. That's a lot of people that come to us, and they're desperate. They're, they're desperate for anything. So they, they, they'll do whatever they can, even before they get pregnant, they're trying to look for childcare spaces. So this is, people are getting nervous about how they can get into the workforce, how they can continue their family, families, uh, continuity, um, and have a, have a child. How do we, how do we say to the parents in this, in this meeting today, everything's gonna be okay, we're, we're working as hard as we can, where are we? Are we doing enough to make sure that those numbers come down rather than going up in the future? So there's a systematic approach to that. So we're, we're, we've, we've given the examples of some of the initiatives that are underway now to create that physical space or to support the physical space. We have to, we have to be attentive to building the workforce at the same time and at a rate within which the system can handle that growth. And we've just uh, increased the number of um, the capacity numbers and centers. So. We'll hopefully see the results of that now over the next short time. The increase in capacity, the increase in infant group size, and the low interest loan, and other incentives for capital um, investments that'll be that'll be uh, that'll be attended to. Go ahead, one more. Yeah. So we talked about that between 80 and 125 is where we have to go. You make a you make a a change like that with it's 45 kids per center. That is a, a lot of children. That is a lot of pressure on the frontline service, the director, and I think it goes to an ECE three. There is a spot missing where these facilities will need an associate director. They will need higher management. They will need more training and more skills. Um, I know it's what we have to do, but have you looked at that position in between that 
So, uh, so we did note we did note that there there is we recognize the need for those additional resources, and that will be that will be attended to. Perfect. Okay. Hey, uh, yeah, uh, Peter. Thank you, Laurie and Sonia, for being here. Uh, I'm going to start with some statistics as well because um, the reality of those of us who, um, particularly I think those who represent rural districts, although I think it's true across the province, is that we get regular calls and correspondence from people who are struggling to find space for their families. And yet we're told um, by the minister and others that actually things are better than they ever have been and the best in Canada. And the disconnect between the reality of people's lives and what they're being told is what causes, I think, a lot of distress and confusion for those of us who are trying to see through where the reality is, where the truth lies. And so I'm going to go right back to the beginning of your presentation, where I note on the first page, it, there are four subheadings, research, system growth, UIC designation, what's next. And I noticed you changed a word in the second one. You said, um, instead of system growth, you said space growth. And there is, a, I think I speak for myself, and certainly I, I think I speak for others when I say there is real confusion about when we talk about an increased number of spaces. Um, are we talking about an increased number of available, real, tangible spaces, or are we talking about spaces on paper? So when we are presenting on the number of available spaces, that would be the number of licensed spaces across, across the island. And when we, um, so for example, the, uh, the announcement that we would be creating an additional 300 spaces over the next 18 months, they would not be operational at this point, except for the 80 that are now have gone through the process, they've received their grant, have um, done the necessary renovations in order to increase their license capacity. And so out of that 300, 80 are now operational and we're working towards making, having the others operational within, you know, the time frame was 18 months that we would see those become operational. And we're working with our, and I think what I understand you asking is that of those spaces that are operational, are they being used? Are they available? Is that, yeah. yeah well, I, I guess there's, we use the word space and people have a different interpretation of what that means. And parents would love that to mean, there is a space for my kid, I can send him or her there. Um, but the reality is I don't think that's the case. So um, with the announcement of new spaces, that those would be coming into operation over that 18 month time frame. So not all would be operational at once because they have been approved for funding, they have some renovations that they need to complete, um, we have noticed that there are some supply chain issues still with some equipment, so it may be taking a little longer to get here, or um, the renovations may be taking a little longer to complete than they had originally anticipated. So they're dealing with those bumps in the roads as they are doing what they need to do to have that space ready for children to come into, because we want the space to be ready for, for children. And so once that happens, then the space actually becomes licensed and gets reported on the other side of the licensed spaces that are available across PEI. So that announcement of 300 that was made, for example, last spring, that wouldn't be counted in our licensed space number because those were yet to become licensed. Now 80 of them are licensed, so we're you know, working our way towards that 300 number. Go ahead, Peter. Thanks, Chair. Uh, so since last spring, or close to a year now, we have created, in reality, 80 new spaces. We have a wait list of almost 2,000, perhaps many more than that, because not everybody goes through with, the, with putting their name on the registry. That's an enormous gap. When I, when I look at the, there was a chart that you had here of the number of, of licensed spaces. Uh, I'm sorry, I'll try and find what page that was on. Yeah, right near the beginning, actually. I'm not sure what slide this was, but basically it flatlined at 2022. 
It went up a little bit between 2018 and 2022. And then we've seen an increase between 2022 and January of this year of uh, just over 100, um, 100 licensed spaces. Now, if I was to overlie on that graph population growth of Prince Edward Island, you would see a very different picture. You would see a fairly flat line for the first few years and then for the last three or four years. I mean, it's, it's been increasing substantially for a long time, but it's accelerated recently. So how can we possibly hope to service the population of this island with, with basically a stagnant number of positions? I think that what we can we can say uh, with that, you know, uh, not as significant growth in those years is that our centres were still recovering. So they had been through two years of the pandemic, which had significant implications for them in operating their centres. It was a lot of stress, a lot of strain on operators and um, you know, it, it takes a little while to, to come back out of that and to be able to see a way then to move from the just maintaining and being able to keep going with what you already have to looking to the future at what that growth can look like for their centers. So that had that had an impact. We we know the stress that our that our educators were feeling during those two years. And then on top of that, um, then we had Fiona, which caused some significant strain um, for some, some centers as well. So now we're, we're through that and we're working hard with our operators to, for those that are able to increase their capacity to now begin to, to do that. Things may, um, they're moving along for those operators who have applied for grants and who wish to increase their numbers. And we are, we are very optimistic that we're going to see those numbers grow at a more significant rate over the coming months. The other piece to the pie, I think, is open designations. So to be able to apply for EYC designation right out the gate when you apply for your license will make a huge difference. I, well, we hope. <laughs> we hope it's you know, another one of the, of the workable solutions because up until that, like, it's hard to make a business model in your mind work at $10 a day, right, for parent fees. So the open designation applications will, we think, make a big difference. And, and Peter, you can definitely ask about what are the open designations coming along again? So, so that's now. That's now. Yeah, that's yeah. now. Okay. Great. That's right, Peter. Yeah, no, no problem. I appreciate you asking the for the clarification. Um, again, sticking with statistics for now because I'm still trying to get a handle on what the reality is out there. Um, I, I have Stats Canada data in front of me, and I just want to make sure when you spoke at the beginning, Sonia, about you can't use these uh, general, or you can't generalize from these, I think was how you said it. So, so uh, are these the data that you were referring to? Yes. So the, so the, so the first slide, which was, I think, the one most, most, most talked about publicly recently, is looking at all types of childcare. So that's looking at unlicensed grandparents, um, licensed childcare. So it, it, that's not the number really that we would be looking to, it's the licensed childcare. So to see the increase when you go down that next level, and I have to have it open to show you how to sort of skim that data. So if you, if you, if you break it down one step deeper, you can see the increase in licensed child care participation and the decrease in unlicensed child care participation. When you look at the general um, table in the beginning, it's a bit misleading because it includes the unlicensed child care, which we have decreased. Peter, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, one of the things that was said last week um, or two weeks ago now, I'm sorry, when Chances presented to the Standing Committee was the challenges of, and you mentioned we really hope that the open U UIC designation and a bunch of other things which you included in your slides here are going to mean that we will actually have a system that will grow in parallel with the population and the needs of our province. 
but they pointed out some really challenging financial uh, situations related to starting up a new EYC. And this was coming from an organization that's very well established here with a, a lot of institutional knowledge, um, a large um, sort of organizational managerial capacity, and even they were struggling to open a new EYC, in their case it was in Kensington. And they were going to have to carry some debt for an extended period of time, despite all of the changes and all of the things that have happened. And my concern is that if an established organization with all of these resources and this history and tradition and knowledge of, this, of the system is struggling to open a new EYC, how can we possibly expect people with no financial backing, without the history and tradition of a place like Chances, open a new EYC under current conditions? So if I understood correctly what um, they were speaking to in particular was um, at that time there was a six month waiting period and they chose to pay the wage grid and, and sort of, you know, maintain a standard that came with the funding. Um, so again, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, it's been um, a, a push from ECDA for many years to have this open designation so that folks knew right out the gate if I'm applying to open a child care center I know I'll be eligible for EYC designation right from the beginning so it would be our hope that that this will address that and as mentioned no center has has uh, has forfeited their designation due to you know financial hardship so it really does make a difference to have that EYC designation and the funding attached to that well, um, I'm going to put you back on the list and let's just yeah, follow fine, up yeah. to this one. I, there's lots of questions here. I want to make sure everybody gets a chance. Thank, thanks for your, your patience and understanding. Okay. We're going to go to Susie. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming in today. Um, your presentation was great. I had a bunch of questions and they all got answered in the presentation. So I just want to say that um, I think that the, the tremendous amount of work that you've put into making sure that our uh, ECEs and our daycares are full of um, enriched learning um, to prepare kids to get into our school system, to set them up for success, um, is clearly uh, evident in everything that you've laid out from wages to um, extra bodies in the building that take on um, not necessarily just looking after kids but helping to facilitate the peer-to-peer uh, -peer and other types of things that are happening in daycares are wonderful. Um, my question just would be that do you have centers that are home-based centers that you may be in uh, consultation with but haven't necessarily come on board yet with um, getting that designation of a center? Um, if, there ha if you have a number of those in the wings or if there's anything that we can do to um, just boost that knowledge to the people that mm -hmm. are in the community that have home daycares that aren't getting the... Really appreciate that question. Um, we're just in the process right now of updating some, um, some handouts that, you know, we, we could be sharing that could be perhaps informative for those that are providing home child care now that might be interested in licensing and becoming a part of that public system. Um, so we'll certainly keep everyone apprised of when those are available. And we do have a number of applicants who are in the licensing process for a family home center license. So various stages depending on um, you know when they applied and, and what their realities are for licensing. So, um, but we are working with them and uh, anticipate that number is going to grow. Susie? My follow-up question is just, uh, I, I love what you're doing, we just need more of it. <laughs> <laughs> Move over to uh, Carla. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for your presentation and for being here today. Um, I guess I have a lot of, a lot of questions. I'm going to try to stay focused. So the $10 a day um, child <coughs> the federal funding that was received, um, so the, all of the funding comes from the federal government. It's up to the provinces to, to okay, you're shaking your head, so obviously <laughs> I got that wrong. But basically what I'm wondering when you explain that, my question is, has this influx of federal dollars led to any cost savings for the province? So the, uh, I think the easy answer there would be no, because we've just increased our spending. 
Um, so the federal, the federal contribution has has helped and supported this this continued growth, um, but provincially um, the contribution is still higher than that of the federal government. Carla, thank you, Chair. Um, can you can you explain that a little more? How does that work? What what is the agreement? So the agreements are all online, um, and the action plans are there. Um, there's the action plan is what's funded. So there's several initiatives under that action plan. So for instance, um, two of the wage increases were were made available with the federal support, but several previous and some since have been through provincial dollars, for instance. Carla? Thank you, Chair. Um, another thing, I, I'll check out those agreements. Um, the other, that could take me another hour or two, so. <laughs> um, the other thing I'm wondering about, something that we heard from Chances and also something that I hear a lot from advocates as well as parents looking for childcare, is before and after childcare. So people telling me, you know, the $10 a day is great, but it costs me significantly more money to send my child for an hour before school and an hour after school. Mm -hmm. Is there any plan, two-part question, what is the plan for after-school care? And the second question is, what is the province doing to ensure the equitability, the equitable costs of those programs as well? So I, I did uh, reference that just lightly. Um, re we recognized that when child care went to $10 a day, it would increase pressures on school-age child care, for sure. Um, pressures in all kinds of ways, pressures for space, pressures on cost. Um, so right now we're undertaking a review of the current system, so to look at, um, at, at what's currently being offered. And as Doreen shared earlier, um, early on in the slide, there is a variety of school-age before and after school programming offerings across the province. Some offer on PD day, some don't. Some open at Christmas, some don't. Some open during the summer, some don't. Some are just after school, some are before and after school. Some are run in schools, some are in community centers. Like there's just such a variety. Um, we really want to take a good look. And those programs in some cases have been operating for, for many years. So we really want to take a good look at those programs um, and, and work with those programs to identify the gaps, but also then look broadly, um, both across this country and others, to see what best practice examples are of what's happening for before and after school care. Carla. Thank you, Chair. And I mean, this it's not a new problem identified. Is, is this work, whenever you say all those things about identifying gaps, is this work that's Undergoing, and we'll expect it's, an action plan mm -hmm. soon. Okay, you can put me back on the yeah, list. Yeah, I will okay. for sure. Um, Robbie, uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, and thanks for the presentation. I, I have to admit, as I was sitting here listening to it, especially at the start, I and you know the the talk about the spaces available. I was trying to decide: is this a fairy tale, or are we on a reality <laughs> show? Because I have to admit, as I deal with what I see in my own district, and I look at some of your numbers here is that uh, it, it, there's a lot of issues out there. So if I look at just the quick numbers here on the infant space, as you say, and removing the duplicates. So in November 2021, you had 1,174 required spaces. Now you need 1,456. You need an increase of 300 more spaces needed. It's the same in just about all of your numbers there. But I, I forget that part of it. I kind of go back to O'Leary, the, the, the area I represent. And I've got really three early year centers that play a role within my district. And in conversations with them, they have you know 80 children each on a list. Now, assuming that there are some duplicates, I mean, you know, I, let's go with, with that. Plus, as an MLA, the calls I get of people that workers who can't return to work, mostly in the healthcare field, uh, and, and in the uh, fishery and things of that nature, uh, there is a big demand for spaces. So, so I'm still trying to get back to the reality is, is that we've got huge numbers of requirements needed. I don't see a lot of new growth happening. I do know of uh, unlicensed daycares that have shut down. There have been a couple of newer just licensed daycares in my community, and that's positive, but if, I'm still into this net loss of spaces. And uh, so what do, I, what do I tell my constituents 
is there help coming for the O'Leary area? Or, or, so know? I think there's two good news stories you can tell everybody you can. Fairy tale or reality now? Real story. Okay. O'Leary and all across BEI. <laughs> So family home centers are a, a real viable option. So license as a family home child care. Uh, there are operating grants, there's capital, there's, there's support there for that. And open designation, so open applications for designation. So if somebody is interested in opening a child care center, they can apply right out the gate at the same time now for early years designation. So those are, those are, those are two good news stories that are and, and I will say, I have pitched the, some of the, the opportunities to, from the programs to get licensed, uh, and I'll, so far, no real amount of takers on that, yeah. so I'm going to hold out judgment on that. But it really begs to the question, so I think it is probably a good move that you're reducing the probationary period, uh, but what do I do about the three that have had to go through the probationary period? Will there be compensation for them to... Like if I look at it in O'Leary's case, I personally went out and, and got corporate sponsors for six months to try to help, help them get started, right? So I, I do think that that should be addressed for these nonprofit organizations, of which all three of them are, you know, not private businesses, uh, to help them alleviate some of the work, you know, level the playing field, so to speak. So will that happen? So what I what I what I think has happened as the system has grown, um, I think back to you know when I started or even before it was kindergartens and church basements, and they've you know evolved now to being in public school classrooms. So there's there's an evolution that happens as we grow systems, and I think that it is in 100% um, due to. The commitment of folks that jumped on 14 years ago and ever since that have you know really built and strengthened this system. Robbie, well, well just but do you feel that's fair. You know why would one organization have to go out and get corporate sponsors and other things to try to allow them to follow the the requirements to become a designated early year center, and then now today somebody can just get it mm -hmm. right away. <laughs> Well, I don't, we certainly, I don't think that's fair. I we've certainly that. been in consultation with the ECDA on, on this and have had conversations around, you know, how, how, how will this sort of roll out. And uh, ECDA felt really positive that this was, a, this was a really good move and this was a necessary move and that we won't grow the system without moving in this direction. Yeah, go ahead, one more. Okay, uh, just, uh, and as I was looking at the issues around some of the wages, and I, I do commend the department as it has increased a lot of the wage grids for especially some of the trained people, but, but as chances have identified, as well as the cook and non-certified support staff are really still at minimum wage with, now you did give sort of me an indication that there might be something that's going to be looked at that. Uh, but uh, I certainly see that as a real reality because you not only have the, the cost of the wages that aren't competitive and, uh, for the ability to attract any staff, you also have the issue of the food costs and I think the chances had identified that issue are their operational costs and I guess that we had debate on whether they were actually getting an increase or not. But can you uh, give us any more of a more accurate depiction of uh, when those uh, wage grid uh, issues for those on certified and cooking staff? Because in the end of the day, if you don't get people at the ground level to even get their foot mm -hmm. in the door to work in that environment, their ability to go up to the, the EC1, the intern, and onwards is less likely, right? And it's, and it's extremely competitive out there. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so I think that has to be addressed, and I, I would hope if your base is even at 17, 23, I think you're going to even have to go quite a bit higher than that even to get anybody that would be interested in, uh, with any competencies in cooking for children. <laughs> what I can say is it's our 100% um, priority that we're supporting centers to be successful. Fairy tale again. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're back to the list. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, Robin, did you have a question? Yeah, sure, yeah. Thank you, Chair, and thank you both for presenting to us today. There's lots of great conversation and lots of encouraging information coming out of this. Um, I have one question, I have two questions actually, but uh, Carla had asked uh, one of them about the uh, before and after school care, but I have one question uh, concerning children with disabilities and the need for one-on-one -on -one support um, and the challenges with uh, you know the staffing issues that we have and uh, 
no doubt the the financial consideration for a business to uh, to have on staff that uh, uh, that ECE for one on one. Uh, is there any funding and recruitment uh, initiatives, or or are we are we looking at that um, currently? Yeah, so um, right now there is no wait list for special needs funding. So there is a special needs funding grant that centres can apply when they have child, a child or children in their program with exceptional needs where they do need additional support in that space. So they can apply for that grant. Now, historically, yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, filling those positions, the special needs assistance positions, at times has been very difficult for centres. And um, the wage, you know, has been a huge implication in that difficulty to, to hire. Our recent announcement of uh, certification level changes, and in particular, the pathway to become certified as an early childhood associate with a human services or human studies type of uh, degree, or diploma or degree, that is opening up certification pathways for a lot of individuals who are currently working in the system and can't find themselves on a wage grid or who have been hesitant to accept a position within an early childhood centre because of the wage that is, was funded through that grant. If they are certified, we have the special needs um, assistant wage grid, which mirrors essentially the earlier centre wage grid. So if you are certified at the early childhood intern, associate, or early childhood educator level, then you find yourself on that wage grid um, with the corresponding um, level. Rob? So yeah, I'm really encouraged to see the numbers and the, the wage increases for our ECEs because they are so important. And uh, I just want to echo Robbie's uh, comments on our support staff and our cooks, and who are also a very essential component in our ECEs, uh, early learning centers. So uh, I just, again, want to echo Robbie's comments on that is something that we really need to work on and support moving forward, so thank you. Um, absolutely. And we have our internal processes that we do need to go through for approval, so hopefully announcements, you know, coming up. Thank you. Okay, so um, I wanted to ask a few questions before we go back around. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for coming in and also echo the thanks to all of the people who worked for so many years, really at wage levels didn't reflect the value they were adding and built the sector and put PEI at the top of the country. Um, for real, true professional early learning and, uh, and all the people on the administrative side who, who built that as well. So thank you for that. Um, my first question has to do with, um, the, again, going back to that, uh, that second table in the presentation uh, with the total number of children on the registry. I'm looking at the numbers, for example, for Queens County, excluding Charlottetown, Stratford, and Cornwall. And when, and it kind of like what Robbie was saying, when I talk to, say, the Gulf Shore uh, EYC or the Hunter River EYC, I would think that their waiting list total more than than that, like than 49, just each one individually. And and I'm I'm just I'm trying to figure out what I'm missing here. And I know you've spoken about this a couple of times, but maybe just one more time to clarify. Thank you. So, so, so we have the total number of children, and then we have the numbers of children requiring or identifying as needing immediate six months, one year, under each age group. So what we do find, and what we found with paper lists in the past, and why this electronic waiting line was more efficient, was because everybody's waiting list looks the same. Everybody's waiting list has the same children on it. And in a paper list, when, when you know, I would sign up at Doreen's Center, it, your name wouldn't come off my list. So I would still have this sort of inaccurate list, whereas electronically, they just automatically remove when accepted into a center. So it does keep it a bit more um, accurate. And they're all the same. <laughs> Parents are signing up mostly for 10, 15, 20 centers, wherever they can sort of, you know, manage to, to drive to. So they, they are the same for okay. the most part. 
Thank you for repeating that again. I'm still trying to get it through my head. I wanted that. Uh, you wanted to hear it too, Gordon. Well, that's good. Um, and and I and I just wanted again, just because we're, we're talking, like I'm looking at Prince County, and I see that uh, the rural municipality, municipality of Kincora is doing a big expansion of their EYC because they had a massive wait list. Um, and so again, looking at the numbers for Prince County, I'm thinking they're going to fill. I mean, it looks like it could be up to, uh, I'm guessing another 125 by the size of the expansion. And that doesn't seem to be reflected in the list, but I'm not gonna harp on Well, they wouldn't be counted as, they wouldn't be off the registry until those spaces are open, right? right. I guess that's my point. The registry seems, number seems low, considering they're gonna put 125 people in there right away from just in that area, area mm -hmm. right? But um, thank you. I know the challenges with the registry are, are many and uh, Kudos to the ECDA, I believe, who manages the registry. And, and I know you're working with, with private uh, companies, and there's no, I, I don't even know if there's a legislative requirement for them to report. Uh, maybe that's a question for you. Not legislatively, but contractually, there is okay. inclusion to use the registry. Yeah. All right, so my, my next question here, um, I, I wanted to, ask about the family home centers again. Now you're saying there's lots of support for family home centers to get, to get going. I know that the, the skills and aptitudes it takes to be a, to be a good uh, EC are not necessarily the same ones you need to run a business. And that can sometimes be a barrier. Um, we had chances here uh, a couple of weeks ago, as was alluded to, and, and they're, they're looking to, you know, expand. And, and I brought the question, I said, would you be willing to work with family home centers, lend your expertise on the administrative side and experience to, uh, you know, kind of almost mentor them, probably for a share of the profits, of course. I mean, they, they, uh, they do want to make money. Um, but it would allow that expansion and, and kind of have... Um, either this mentorship relationship or maybe an affiliation re relationship between existing early year centers and family home centers. And I just wanted to see what you thought of that idea, if there's any merit in it or if there's a big gotcha that, it, that uh, is just jumping right out. I actually had a conversation with family home center operator recently uh, on this topic and um, we, we talked about the opportunities for creating relationships between a family home center operator and an early year center. So in particular, um, in this case, the family home center operator was looking to accept infants into, into their program. Uh, because that is where the most significant need is, but wondered what that would look like when the infants aged out and were, you know, turned 22 months, and where would they go? Because they didn't really have a relationship with other centers in the area. So we did talk about how to begin to create some discussions around uh, relationship building with family home centers and. Um, and earlier centers. Well, thanks. I look forward to seeing how that may play out and maybe yeah. there's a solution there. Uh, certainly just, uh, pardon the pun, the discussions are in their infancy right now. So my last question before we move back to the list is uh, talk about school age childcare. And um, one thing I know I've talked to some EAs and you know they work for six hours a day we have a former EA here as well, who's a bit of an expert on the top, of course, with experience. But um, they don't, I think, in fact, their wage grid is, is below the, the wage grid for early uh, learning and child care now, in many cases. Uh, it's, it's hard to compare the two because of various things like pensions and all like that. But um, the thought was, you know, they get six hours. They said, if I could expand to eight hours, earn some more money, yeah, I could, you know, work either two hours at the end of my day or two hours at the beginning and maybe provide that school age child care. And if you could actually do that in a school where you have the, the space that if there was unused space, I, again, there'd be scheduling. If you wanted to use the gym, it might not be available, things like that. But again, I wanted to know if that sort of solution, uh, being as you're part of the greater Department of Education, is something that you've been discussing with your colleagues uh, in the department. So school-age childcare is licensed through our division. Um, so two, two, two 
kind of answers there. One, we've created a, um, a network of operators, school age um, operators, who have come together on a couple of occasions just to start to have these kinds of conversations. And through those conversations, we've actually learned that there are some centers that are located in schools that do actually try to make that partnership work with EAs. Some of the challenges, the end of one day and the start of another, don't always line up. So um, when the EA is finished working, the, the school age our center already has a need for staff. So they try and juggle that around a little bit, but some of them do make that work. So there is an example of that for sure. Um, and, and the other is to say that we're doing this review right now um, and working with this committee of operators to really take a good look at what options there could be going forward to um, optimize all potential you know, opportunities to, to gain staff for these programs, because that is one of the challenges that the school age programs do have, is staffing. Not just, not just in um, you know, the who, but it's the how long, right? It's a short day, it can be, if it's just after school, so to hire somebody for three hours a day isn't uh, isn't always a real incentive. So looking, looking at all the gaps in that service that needs to be filled in order to create it as, a, as a, um, an opportunity that people are lined up waiting to come to work at. <laughs> oh, that's great. I mean, space and staffing seem, seem to be the two main barriers. And if you could Absolutely. use space in existing schools and staff that are already there, that'd be amazing. So I look forward to hearing more about that as well. <laughs> Over to Gord. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot. Um, just going back to open designations, did did your did the department send out a message to all all operator centers yesterday or the day before, just recently announcing this? Yes. And in that, did it say it was it was open? It's an open application process. So it used to be that it was at, by invitation. So whenever the call would go out. Okay, so, but it's, but all the information is online and open now? Oh, no. I see, I see, I see what you mean. The, yeah. No, so the, the, the decision to um, have an open invitation has been made, and so that's been approved. We're now um, getting our webpage up and running and changing the application form to align with this new way of processing UIC applications. Because in that message, I have the correspondence here, and it says, stay tuned for more details. As soon as the new open application process is online, we'll be promptly notifying you to ensure current non-designated early alert centers and child care centers are amongst the first to access the updated system. So those that are non-designated now have, have, have had the opportunity to apply for early years designation along the way, and some of which we're, we're, we're continuously working with already. Okay, so it might be, it's it just what the, the information that came out verbally didn't, didn't match what went out to people. So if, I'm, if I got a message and it said, stay tuned for more details, when are they gonna get these details? Yeah, so we just have to change that application to align with our new way of processing them and we'll reach back out to those non-designated centres to let them know that the open application is there. All centres that would have been eligible were invited during our last round and centres make decisions to apply for EYC designation or not to apply for EC, EYC designation for a variety of reasons and it's not mandatory that they apply, they must choose to apply. Go ahead, Gord. Yeah, and that's really that's really important information to clarify because I think that people people wanted to, obviously the child care operators are scared. They're, 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 this is a new way compared to what we heard from Chances with, especially with the Kensington example. Um, and I think my colleague uh, uh, Mr. Henderson talked about that too as well. So I'm I'm concerned too that if people if there's such a change, it would, it's it's a change for the good. But why did we why did we have it the other way? for so long before. Did, wasn't that limiting, um, limiting the opportunities? And what are we gonna do for the people that had their opportunities limited as we open this up? When we started to designate centers, we had um, an excess of space around that time. So as was mentioned earlier, the one center that did give up their designation was due to low enrollments. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you have one more, Gord? 
Yeah, and I, I think it's it's definitely this is this to me says okay we're finally getting to an all hands on deck. I think it was a conservative approach up to now, honestly. Like I think we could have done more because the demand is there, and that's that's where I'm getting at is that now now we're we're really in a position where we need these these spaces. So this could be a positive. I just think that the communication could be could be better going forward. So yeah, you can put me back on the list. Now. Okay, Peter. Thanks, Chair. Uh, it's tempting sometimes in our roles to think that um, all problems can be solved with more money, and, and typically that's not, that's not the case. But I actually think in, when we come to the problem that we have here, which is encouraging more UICs and those that already exist to expand, that the financial viability is actually the primary primary barrier to us creating the spaces that we need. And I'm going to go through a couple of challenges that I see if I were somebody who wanted to come forward. I really think that the wage issue has been dealt with, and thank you for that. Um, for years, our caucus called for wages of early childhood educators to be in line with the duties that they perform, the responsibilities and the importance of it. So thank you. I'm really glad that that has happened. I don't think that's a barrier at this point. Um, physical space absolutely is. We talked a little bit about schools, but so many of the schools are bursting at the seams, um, and the thought of incorporating childcare inside a building that's already struggling to meet the needs of enrolled students from K to whatever it is, um, I think that's that's. Maybe Robbie would call that a fairy tale. I don't know. Um, but I am interested in other because, I mean, we all know the state of real estate here on Prince Edward Island and the expense related to whether you're renting it or, or buying it or building it. And I'm wondering whether you've looked at other publicly owned physical spaces um, as potential places where government could assume that cost, provide the facility um, without a new operator or existing operator having to shoulder that cost? We are exploring that. So do we have an inventory of public spaces that would be suitable for childcare? So we've worked across departments to look at the inventory and as well worked across departments to look at what capital projects are upcoming that could include a child care centre. And can you tell me how many you've identified that could be potential childcare centres? So there's there's one for sure that really is like super potential. Um, there are a handful of others that are possible, um, and then looking at the at the capital too, or at the um, uh, yeah the construction sure. upcoming. Okay, I'm really I'm really glad to hear that. I mean the 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 daycare centre that I have. Had most experience working with, and you would both be very familiar with his group, Hawkins. They've sort of come across and, and gone around or over or dug under almost every barrier that exists for an early year. In, well, they're, they're not designated EYC, but um, a for profit childcare centre here on the island. And just by sheer good fortune, uh, the South Shore United Church is going to extend their lease. But without that, that there was really nowhere else for them to go. And they looked at, of course, Englewood School and a bunch of... Anyway, mm -hmm. I, I'm really glad to hear that you're looking at an inventory of public space. The third challenge that I see is the funding formula, which has not been updated for some time now. And we all know what inflation has done to costs here. Um, just basic fixed costs that any business, including a childcare centre, would have. Are you doing a review of the funding formula? And if so, when might we see an upgrade or update to that? Do you want to go back to your funding slide? Yeah. So the funding formula, and I, I, you know, I don't want to get too deep into the funding formula because uh, that would take beyond my expertise to be, uh, to be getting at the ins and the outs of it. But the funding formula is designed in such a way that as wages increase, then the portion of funding that is available for operational costs increase, increases as well. And as parent fees decrease, that government funding increases. So even though the funding formula itself um, is the same funding formula that we've utilized all along, the funding that is going out to centers is increasing. 
and that is in in um, you know a significant impact to that funding formula has been the wage increases over the last number of, of years. So if we look at the this slide for EYC funding, you'll see that a center that re has remained at as an example, 46 full-time spaces with ECE3s at their level one staffing, the funding available, the funding that's going out to that center has increased over the years. So it's not that the funding itself remains stagnant. It changes depending on the inputs into the financial formula. And the inputs have increased on the wage side and decreased on the parent fee side. So the government funding going into centres has increased. Um, and I appreciate that and I do, as much as I can, understand the complexities of the formula and the 0.8 for, yeah. uh, for parent fees yes. and 1.2 yeah. for a low, make your head spin. <laughs> anyway, the, again, going back to the realities, having spoken to a number of operators, the, the crux of it is that it does not seem to be meeting their needs currently and that they are being squeezed in terms of profitability and therefore financial viability more and more. So I'm going, to, I'm going to reiterate the question. Are you looking at the funding formula and do you have plans to update it? So um, what I would say is that we would be very interested to meet with any earlier centre who, you know, is indicating that they are having some negative financial impacts due to their current realities, because that is not coming into us at, at the department. Um, we, have had, we have had a couple of centers that reached out to us as parent fees decreased, and we met one-on-one -on -one with, with those operators to show them, using their numbers and in their context, the funding formula and how it how it uh, works for them, and once they were able to see that they weren't negatively impacted as as parent fees decreased, for example, then that alleviated some of the the stress that they were feeling because they were able to see, okay, no, I'm going to be okay here. Parent fees are decreasing, yes, but government is increasing the funding to compensate for that decrease in parent fees. So. I, I, again, our doors are always open and would strongly encourage that if you're having conversations with any earlier centres who are indicating this to you, mm -hmm. that they do reach out to us because we really would love to sit down with them to understand their current realities. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Go ahead, Peter. Uh, and Doreen, last time, last time we met, it was related to a home-based licensed childcare centre in my district uh, when the operator knew that the the, the parental fees were going to be reduced from 20 at that time to 10, um, but there was no assurance that the government grant to compensate for that, what you've just described, was going to be in place. And I was very glad, to, and I was aware of this, of course, that it was going from 15 to 30 yes. for home-based childcare centres. And a question around that is, um, is that based on a per capita formula, or is that just, is it for every home-based childcare centre, regardless of how many kids they have, um, on board, is it going to be the same amount for each of them? Yeah, so uh, the way that that uh, grant works is that they are eligible for up to a certain amount of, of dollars. Right now it's at the 30000 and we are, are looking at that grant and uh, what, what uh, needs to change with that grant amount in order to meet their needs moving forward. So they provide information to us on the number of children that they've enrolled and they request an amount up to that, that uh, maximum. And so we work with centres individually based on what they are requesting, but they would be eligible for the full amount of the grant and then we, we, uh, we review what they present to us as far as the number of children that they have enrolled. Okay. okay, one more. Yeah, it's a follow-up to that. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that, yes. Doreen. Um, so it is actually a per capita formula that is used then, but from what you've just described, that you've got, or the, the operator can apply based on the number of children, because it makes no sense to me to offer the same grant to everybody if you have two kids in your home-based childcare or 15. I mean, that the, the money is is not, you need, you need to have a, an amount of money that's, related to the number of kids yeah. that you have. So um, is 30 for, I, I don't know what the largest home-based um, 
licensed childcare centre would be here on Prince Edward Island. But if that's the cap, is that uh, are we dealing with an equitable system here, first of all, and is that enough for the largest home-based licensed childcare centre to operate um, viably, given that parents are now only only paying ten dollars a day? So I think it's difficult just to look at the numbers of children that are in that centre because. Uh, but surely, if the income comes from parents paying for a child, if each child's if the parental contribution is going down from 20 to 10, that's a severe drop in their income. So therefore, this is actually crucial. The number of kids is crucial in terms of this. So family home centers are <coughs> out, um, utilizing a ratio, the same uh, mm -hmm. that an early childhood center would, and that's for the health, safety, and well-being of children, so that we know that um, licensed regulated programs are, um, you know, adhering to the ratios that are set out in the Early Learning and Child Care Act. So the maximum number of children that can be in a licensed family home center is eight. But you could have an operator of a family home center who enrolls three infants into their program, and that put this, puts them at their maximum ratio. So just to look at the numbers can be deceiving because they're at full ratio at three infants where another operator may have eight and, but still be under ratio um, if they're, they're all four year, years old, but their, uh, their cap is eight. So that's why we review each in, um, application individually. And one thing that I neglected to mention earlier is that we do have an infant incentive portion of the, oper of the operational grant that's available to family home centers because we know the areas of graded need are infants and toddlers, and we want to provide an incentive for family home centers to accept those age groups into their programs. And so um, there's a, they're eligible for up to, to $10,000 annually for um, accepting three infants and caring for three infants at one time. Can you put me back on the list, I please, Jim? Sure. Okay, um, I guess, uh, Mark Kyla. Thank you, Jim. Um, so one of the things that we heard in, in Chance's presentation, as well as just kind of hearing it anecdotally as well, um, is kind of all the, the, the barriers and the bureaucratic processes involved in opening a new centre or, or trying to get access to, to different um, provincial financial assistance for that. So I'm wondering, um, is government looking at establishing a position to liaise with, with people who, are, who would like to start a new earlier center or who are looking at possibilities for, for changing what they're doing. Um, is there any talk of, of that happening? Because I know there's people who are like, we just we just don't know where to go, where to access it. You know, they hear that people didn't even know they were there. Just so, is there any talk of that to support? So we actually have um, made some changes to the structure with the early years division. And so, Previously, we had um, two sections within our division, early childhood development and early years autism. So we changed the structure of our division so that individuals who are seeking to have questions answered more clearly know where they need to go to have those questions answered. And one of those changes is the creation of the licensing and compliance section within our division. So rather than have an individual who's responsible, we do have a section that is completely responsible for licensing and compliance issues. And the manager of licensing and compliance would be the individual that um, would be the go-to should there be any questions around licensing or trying to navigate some of those uh, you know, paths to licensing because we do work with a number of uh, other entities towards licensing. It's not only the uh, early years and the Early Learning and Child Care Act. There are other inspections that, ha that have to happen, so environmental health and fire inspections. Um, we support applicants who are trying to work their way through zoning questions. And um, so we feel that the changes that we've made to our structure in the division are really going to make a significant change to um, an individual's ability to navigate our own waters. Carla? Thank you, that's, that's really great to hear because that's something that, I, well, they were very clear in spelling out and also things that just over the last five years or so 
you know, I keep, I keep hearing that. And these are recent changes, so as of September, so. Oh, that's great. Great. Um, I'm just looking where I made notes and I can't find it. Um, so I'm wondering about, I had some prepared questions, but then I, I had um, special needs assistance kind of popped into my head and I, I'm making a connection to that on the same as after school, so you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but um, I guess I'm kind of wondering how we determine need and, and how we ensure, is that a flexible amount of funding? Because I just hear, it seems there's continual stories and it tends to involve families where there's two children and you know, when they need a special needs assistance so they're, they're not able to perhaps be independent for the whole day or, or whatever the reason. Um, and if families need two, they're given options like for their kids to go to daycare at two different times and just really mm -hmm. making it inconvenient for families because they need childcare for a reason. You know, it's not Absolutely. like they have, they can just, they're not sending one child so they can stay home and look after the other. They need childcare so they can work. So I'm wondering um, how that's, a, like how that, that fund rolls out, how it's determined and is there, what are, what are, how's it, where are the gaps there? What do you, what are the things you're noticing about issues with that? Yeah. So the way that grant currently operates is that there is a budget that's associated with the grant and centers apply for funding for a special needs assistant and based on the needs that they've identified and uh, then the grant really is to support hiring a staff into their program to lower the ratio for the group in which there's a child or children with exceptional needs. So that's the way that this funding program has operated since for many, many years. And um, so as Sonia mentioned on the last slide of what's next, we know that uh, this is a priority area for, for us to look at, a diversity and inclusion across the island. And as part of that, we are you know, looking at all of the programs uh, that are associated with diversity and inclusion that are offered through the early years division. And so we'll be happy to come back at another time to provide some of those updates once we work our way through the process. Well. Thank you, Chair, and, and I look forward to that because that is something that, that I hear quite a, quite a bit about um, just over the years, just kind of here and there. Um, I guess my next question too, talking about population growth. So we know government is supposed to be coming out with a population growth strategy. We're supposed to see a framework, sorry, not a strategy, a framework. <laughs> and I, you know, common sense tells me that child care is an essential component of a population growth framework. Have you had any conversations with government around this? Mm -hmm. I sit on that on that committee that's looking at that. Go ahead, Kyla. Okay, thank you, Chair. Just uh, thank you. Uh, so can you can you elaborate a little bit on that? Wondering what what that looks like because we don't really see a whole. As I'm like, oh, okay, it feels like a trick question. No, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm just I'm really trying to understand. It's a, it's a grave concern across the board, and especially with childcare, we're not really seeing a huge growth here, you know, our population growth is going to, the, the growth of the list of people waiting for childcare are going to grow as our population grows. And so I'm wondering what inputs you're having into, I guess, what you're advocating for from the perspective of childcare. So I think that you would be able to um, see more of what we're advocating for and working towards through our Canada-wide agreements and um, bilateral agreements and those action plans. I think that's, that's more where our um, vision plays out a lot more clearly. And, you know, PEI started 14 years ago to, to create this designated system. So, you know, it was a slow roll, sure, to start. Um, but it took centers a, a, a long time to kind of get on to that kind of system too. And it took us a long time to build up the workforce back from when we lost our hundred to public school kindergarten. Um, so, you know, we've, 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 we've been in this sort of progressive increase um, to, to grow the system. And when I say that, grow the system, I don't mean just spaces. I mean the workforce. I mean the facilities. I mean our team to support those that are out there working hard every day. So um, I, I, I don't think that we're necessarily changing course. Um, those action plans would be our, our, our gauge. 
and you know do do we still have a lot of spaces to grow absolutely but you know we're, we're going to keep that strategic approach of working with the workforce building that workforce and trying to create the, the physical space availability I can put you back on the list if you like sure okay. Bobby yeah just a uh, quick clarification I guess that earlier in your, one of your earlier slides there in the early years uh, early year centers the increase in the capacity from 80 children to 125 the you said you're in increase in the infant group size from 6 to 12 and, and change to some of the wage grids all that sounds really great but I just want a clarification on that is there any change to the complement of staff required for those amount of children so in, that, in other words is it the same complement of staff that would deal with sick children can now deal with 12? No. So, um, okay. Now so we're in a fairy tale. Yeah, no, no, this no, is no, 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 this is the real story. <laughs> <laughs> this is the real truth. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so the Atkin regulations, they lay out the ratios of staff to children, yeah. and that ratio is dependent on the age of the children. Yeah. So if you're increasing from six infants to 12 infants, at six infants you would be required to have two staff, at 12 infants you're required to have four staff. Mm -hmm. um, and then so that's, on. So that's not changed. So, right, right the ratios yeah, okay, have not changed. But, but this is what I go back to the fairy tale part of it. Like this was a great numbers that you're increasing. The problem I have in my constituency for the early year centers there, it's the staffing problem. It's not the space. Is it, so if they if they can't get more staff to to do the work, yeah. it, we're not increasing any spaces. <laughs> so so that, that's what I keep trying to, to bring forward here on this is that in the end of the day, you're not solving the, the problem. Even if you had a, said, if you went six to twelve and had to go with three staff, you'd start to see some movement there, right? I I, I can see because like I said, I, I know they could get more space. It, but it's the staff is the problem. So we have to, and I like to say, I like the idea that you've added an associate position in and have a wage grid for that. That is a step in the right direction. But in the end of the day, until you can deal with the staff complement and the training that they have to require to deliver that service, that's your big limiting issue. So you either have to really ramp up your training capabilities to get that, and I'm finding that I'm still not seeing a huge amount of people wanting to enter that profession. Holland College at one time had an early years course in West Prince. Now they don't. So, so in the end, I, I'm still treading my, spinning my wheels here in trying to deal with the real problem of 80 children in each of these different uh, uh, parts of my district that are, are requiring a space. So, so I think that's, that's all. I, I know I don't necessarily have a question that, but I, yeah, now that I you've just, verified I, it, I, sure. I would like to respond just yeah. on, on one oh, aspect of that. And I think that we always need to focus on the health, safety, and well-being of children. We're not disputing that. And ratios are in place so that we can respond to the health, safety, and well-being of children that are in our care. And those ratios are set out um, because, well, for infants, we know that you know, infants take a lot of care. It's really important to, um, to be able to respond to every infant in your, in your program. And that would be difficult if you lowered the number of staff and increased the number of infants. And so paying attention to quality has to be at the forefront and it can't be compromised in order to grow the spaces. We have to be able to maintain quality and grow spaces. It's, it's, I want to make a comment. It's, 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 a, it's a tricky one to maintain the quality. I know when I was minister, I was, I was very hopeful we'd go from definition of an infant from 22 months and lower that down to 18. That way you could bring the people into the ratios for the other child care. It would be a huge win. But they, they did the, the due diligence, the work, the experts, and said, no, infants have to be 22 months. Otherwise, we're not providing the proper care. So it's 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 very important work that's being done. And I understand, Chair, that I, but that's governance. That's the balance that we all try to find, whether it's health care delivery, whether it's early childhood, it's what, what have you. But, but if we're trying to resolve a problem here somehow, and you're going to keep all the standards at a certain level, you're, you're, it's hard to get your, to solve it on the other side of getting the, the needs where we'll say there's a 80 to 100 children in my riding that can't get access to a, an early year center. So, you know, it's just, th these are the things that have to be looked at. They're not easy decisions. I'm not disputing that for a moment. And I don't want to see a dilution of delivery of services either. 
But, but in the end, it becomes a, a fairy tale of saying we've increased all these things, but you're not solving the real crutch of the problem. So our preferred approach would be to, you know, work with those to graduate more ECEs. So we're at 51 grads. We're bringing 24 in through Steps to Success, so that's 75 a year. We have, um, on the workforce slide, we talk about the... Um, talk about education grants that we provide as well. So we're really trying to encourage and support those that are in the system to, to gain that education. So folks can, uh, folks, folks can have that opportunity then to hire somebody and then support them to, to get their training. I wish y'all the best. I'm not gonna <laughs> be so negative here. I don't sound that way, but it's just, uh, that, that's where I see the problem is, is it's about getting the staff and getting them into a wage that is attracting staff and that they want to retain and stay there. So yeah. anyway, thanks for that. Right, just, just a couple of quick questions before we head back to Cord. Um, so if you do have a community hall or even maybe it's a church basement or whatever, are those spaces eligible for the expansion grant for renovations if there is an existing or a new um, director that wants to start an EYC? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Great to hear. Uh, the other question was, um, I just, just want to clarify, I, lo I love the fact that you have the, the licensing and what was it? Licensing and compliance. And compliance. Uh, section now. Um, one of the things, and it, it goes, I think it, it's hand in hand with aptitude things, but um, sometimes people who want to start there, maybe it's a family home center, maybe it's a school age program, um, they, they want to know how do I enter in, and maybe it should be the ECDA. I know that I send you, both of you, or one or the other, or both emails and say, I have this person that needs it. Um, what is the best way to navigate the system? Yeah. Where should we be sending the people? So we've actually contracted with the Early Childhood Development Association to create a guide to licensing in Prince Edward Island. And we are in the final review stages of that document, and so should be ready to go online with that very soon. Oh, that's great to hear. Yes. All right, well, thank you. Gord. Yeah, thanks. Um, so just picking up on uh, where my colleague was talking about, we're, we're talking about quality and that's what we want. And I think we've done a good job and I know the facilities do, but talking about non-licensed home day care programs, um, they're not regulated except for the number of children permitted in the home. <clears throat> and it's a complaint based system. So if we're talking about quality of some kids and then what was in the media just recently, um, what about the quality for the kids in there? If it's a complaint-based system, how does the department legislate, regulate those and get more accountable to the kids that might not be getting the same care as the ones in, in the system? Mm -hmm. So um, you're right. Currently, the, the only regulations for an unlicensed child care provider is that they are operating with the number of children that is permitted for them to operate without a license in the Early Learning and Child Care Act and regulations. And our approach is we really want to work with those operators to become licensed. Uh, we would love to see all of them reach out to become licensed and would really encourage um, them to reach out if they have any questions for us on, on that process. And then, um, so the parents then would be making choices for, for their child care based on what, what works for the, their families. And the Early Childhood Development Association does have on their website for parents a uh, guide to quality early learning and child care, which sets out a number of questions that families can ask when they are going into any child care provider operation, licensed or unlicensed, to make sure that that provider is what they are able to respond to the questions in a way that are meeting the needs for that for that family. So we want to work with the unlicensed to become to become licensed. Board. And I mean that's 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 great and I mean we've done but that's not good enough for those kids that 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 might not get that same support I find is there's got to be something between we would really like them to be licensed and I'm not sure the process why they're not what's going on I mean a $30,000 incentive I want them to be licensed as well but there, there's a gap between that answer and, and, and what we have in our system right now. So I'm just I'm kind of I'm just kind of worried about. I don't know the exact numbers. You would know the numbers and 
and um, th that would be. Do you know how many unlicensed? We no. We don't. No. They're not licensed. They're not licensed. And, and maybe our presenters can comment on this, but I mean, there's a there's a huge number of carrots to move from unlicensed to licensed. Oh, yeah. First being now you're charging parents. $35, $40 a day, and then you can charge them $10 a day with the new program. Plus, you can put yourself on the wage grid potentially and earn more money and all kinds of good stuff, right? The most growth that we've seen in family home centers has been since the drop in parent fee because that's something that, you know, can't easily be matched. So parents are looking for um, other spaces and also the increase to the um, operating funding has also been but it's but it's still early days with that funding so you know opportunities like this to get that word out is yeah. really positive yeah. and we've also sorry just to to add to that we've also had some information sessions um, where mm -hmm. we've invited uh, members from the unlicensed community to come and uh, join a conversation where they can ask questions about the licensing process so that we can hopefully begin to uh, you know, uh, alleviate some of those barriers that we're seeing towards them coming into licensing. And we'll be having upcoming um, sessions as well. And the Early Childhood Development Association has a family home center operator network where licensed or unlicensed, you can come into a discussion. And sometimes there may be misconceptions around what it means to become licensed. And so it's important for us to be able to to respond to what some of those misconceptions might be. And I agree, like it's, it's, we've done everything, but it's just, it just kind of like hits you when you ask that question, it hits you that we don't know the stats and we don't, because people, people have trouble with change at the best of times. So this is a change process and I'm encouraging them to, to reach out and, and to do that. But there'll always be, you know, I just, I really worry about the supply versus the demand, the supply and demand, it's 1900 and, almost 2,000 people, and people will do anything to, to, to provide spaces, and if they can't get them, they're going to, you know, go in alternative routes, which they're probably getting good care, but I'm just, I'm not sure, because it's, we don't know. But um, I just want to, um, a, a quick question here, uh, a couple quick questions, I don't know how many I have left, but um, so, great, great model, we have to increase infant spaces, there's no doubt about it, absolutely move it up, um, definitely 12 people. Like, But that's a major shift when you look at when they transition to the next level. So if you have all these facilities um, increasing infant spaces and we're, we're looking at promoting that, what happens at the next level when they graduate and there's, a, there's two or three times as many kids coming up to the next level and that level's full with children? Uh, I mean, this is a two or three year down the road problem maybe, but what are our plans to alleviate that? Yeah, we're really um, trying to get ahead of that prob problem. And so as part of the request to increase your infant spaces, you have to be able to articulate what your plan is for when those children move into the next age group. So um, we're asking operators to look at the next three or four years and um, what space they have available. So numbers aging out, do you have room for those infants to move up into another other space in your center because what we don't want to happen is for a family to have a space for a few months yeah. and then not have a space to move into so a part of that process is for centers to really be thinking about that and to provide us with what their plan is uh, yeah. one more Gord, if you okay. have yeah and it's it's kind of like it, it's what we're dealing with here we don't know where our population is going and it, it should theoretically demand should continue the spaces are only a certain size, so they can come to you with a plan. But it's 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 almost to the point where I, I looked at the capital budget and I was surprised to see I, I expected a mass demand for just random centers because it's a five-year capital budget where we can build a center. It was in the capital budget. The, the the plans that we see in the capital budget aren't exactly all hashed out. So are we ever moving, and Chance has made a point of this, are we moving towards, we will need capacity. We will need capacity right now. Can we look at a place to build? Like I look at, we've got the QEH is expanding, the, there's a new mental health hospital. We need a facility for childcare somewhere in that area. Um, with, can, you, can you talk about that? Because 
I didn't see it in the capital budget where we can build something and we know that we'll fill it. We know that the people will be there to, to run it, but we need capacity. We need to start thinking about these things now. There is one included in the capital budget. Okay. Without the, yeah. Okay, perfect. How big is it? 125 spaces. Okay. With the new mental health hospital? With uh, residents. Oh, okay. With the new, okay, perfect. Well, it's, we still need more. Right. We've got 1,900 people. <laughs> Wait, go over to Peter. Again. Thanks, Chair. And I, I, that's a good example of that discussion of how we need to start integrating childcare into planning when we build, and particularly a new big facility. So I was very glad to see that. And, um, I hope that we duplicate that in all public buildings that we move from, that we build from now on of a certain size. Um, I'm going to go over a little bit of the same ground that Gore did regarding unlicensed daycare centres. And I think it's important to state up front that no doubt many of them are providing very excellent services. I don't I think we, we need to make that put that on the record. But of course there's essentially no standards demanded, there's no oversight provided. And so that peace of mind that all parents who leave their kids at a licensed daycare, whether it's home based or UIC or whatever it is, um, it, it's just not there. It's not there. And moving those unlicensed daycare centres um, towards presumably home-based daycare centres is what you imagine they would become. Um, I, I know that you've said you've done all the things that you can. Can you tell us what, what you imagine the barriers are? And in the other province, which we all look to when it comes to um, a long long established publicly funded childcare and that's Quebec where they outstrip every other province by a country mile in terms of participation in the system. Um, do they have uh, unlicensed childcare centres there also or is that something which has over time disappeared? That's a great question. I can't answer that with total confidence other than to assume that there would be unlicensed child care there too. I mean, we hear about it all across the country. Yeah. And how about the first part of my question? Sorry, I shouldn't have done that to no. you, but uh, <laughs> what, what you see as the remaining barriers and how we can encourage those providers to become licensed? Yeah, I think, well, I, I know we have heard um, a barrier that has been presented to us a number of years ago from unlicensed operators when we were first um, rolling out some of the incentives that we had for becoming licensed. And certainly one thing we heard was this, um, this uneasiness with having inspections and with having inspectors come into to their home because inspections are part of regulated early learning and child care and licensed family home centers would be having inspections as well. But from the operators that, that we talk to the unlicensed operators, there was this misconception that when an inspector comes into their home, they're inspecting to every part of their home. And that's absolutely not true. Um, an inspector would come in to inspect only the portion of your home that is utilized for early learning and child care. So we are not going down into, you know, areas of your home that, that you utilize for personal use only to do an, an inspection. It is only in the licensed area. And so that, that made it a shift for some individuals because it helped alleviate that fear of having an inspector or, you know, uh, could be, there's three inspections. There's fire, environmental health, and there is uh, early learning and child care board. And so it alleviated that fear of having inspectors come in and be going through your personal stuff. And so that is part of the information that we really want to get out there so that that misconception, for example, is not a barrier to becoming licensed, that we only inspect to that, to that portion that you're utilizing for child care. And again, that's just to ensure that the health, safety, and well-being of children, right, they're in an environment that's, that's, that's meeting those standards. Peter? Appreciate that answer. And, uh, and yeah, I, ho I hope that over time we will see m more and more of them becoming licensed for that peace of mind and health, well-being, safety of kids. Final sort of little knot I'm trying to tie up here personally uh, relates to, and I'm going to go back to the registry. And I know you've been asked to explain it a couple of times. I'm not going to 
request that you reiterate that. But I am going to try and um, blue sky what uh, coordinated, integrated, comprehensive, centralized system might look like so that we wouldn't have all of the issues that you've described now on a number of occasions. Is that something that's a possible? And if it is, is that something that you feel government should be responsible for holding? So we are currently um, reviewing and developing a plan to modernize all of our data systems. And the registry would be part of that. Um, not initially, but it will be part of that at some point. So what does it look like? Um, I think that a lot of the components that exist in this one would still exist. I mean, parental choice is really important. So, you know, I, I, I recognize and appreciate that it does cause some inconvenience for directors when they're moving down their call list and there's some parents that have chosen to stay on the list, but they don't want the space right now, so they have to skip over that and make another phone call. I, I just, we feel really strongly that parental choice is, is important and that is one, um, one of the technical, I think, um, options that would remain even going forward with the registry. It would be really important that parents have that, have that choice. Um, could there be, um, you know, improvements? Probably better to ask ACDA as the managers of that program. Um, I can say that they do respond really quickly to um, any need from the sector. They meet with uh, their supervisors network once a month and this becomes a conversation topic a couple of times a year for sure. And they do incorporate whatever changes the, the, uh, the sector has identified as being a priority and we'll, we're happy to support them with that. You don't have a follow up to that. Um, <laughs> And I'm thinking of the analogies here with our electronic health record system and making mm -hmm. sure that all of the entities can properly communicate and that has been a mm -hmm. challenge, shall I say, mm -hmm. in the health field. Um, I, this, I think I included in my question, maybe I, I wasn't clear, but do you feel that this centralized registry should be held by ECDA or do you think that government should hold that? I think that we would need to understand what the difference would be if we were holding it from, from them holding it. And um, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I don't know if it would be better if we were holding it, if that's what you're asking, or if ECDA was, was operating it. I don't, yeah, I don't, know, what, I, I don't know what I the difference that. would be. Yeah, I haven't thought enough about it to have an opinion <laughs> on it, but I appreciate it. Uh, thanks, Jim. Carla? Oh, I'm good, Chair. Okay. Um, I, I just, I, a quick question following up on what Peter said. So, I mean, the system on PEI for, for licensed daycare with all that goes along with it um, is, is something that's, if I remember correctly, fairly unique in Canada um, and allows us to have more licensed and regulated childcare than most provinces. Um, how how do if you if you know off the top of your head how how do how does PEI compare with other provinces in terms of the amount of unlicensed childcare we have compared to to them? I guess you'd probably have to compare the amount of licensed childcare we have to what they have. Yeah, I couldn't answer that off the top. No, 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 no. Okay, thank you. Move over to Gord. Yeah, just just a couple of quick ones. Um, uh, in the early year center expansion loan interest the program, the pilot project. Why um, wh why was there a 20 year commitment to obtain the funding at the, at the end of that? That was a criteria that they had to be, um, that they had to uh, sign up. Or it says a project must maintain childcare spaces for at a minimum of at least 20 years. Why was that, why was that included? To ensure that it's a childcare center? Go ahead. For 20 years? Doesn't that turn people off potentially about that they can't commit to 20 years? We have six that are interested in having those conversations and that's why it's a pilot, to see what will work, what won't work, see what people are interested in, where the gaps are, what this might, um, what this might um, provide as a solution for some. And like we said, there's not just one solution. We're talking with builders to see what, 
you know, what, what interests we can create with them to build new facilities to, and we're, you know, looking at the capital budget to include with new bills with government. And so there's all kinds of, you know, yeah. components that we're looking at. There's not just one fix to all of this, but. And I just had some, some people come to me and said that was, that scared them. Mm -hmm. Scared them, but there was a new process. It's a pilot program. And now they, they, they want to do, they want to, to do what they're good at, and this was new to them. Mm -hmm. Change, and then they, they said, "Well, 20 years. I don't know if I can. I don't know if I can handle the stress of the next two." Right. Um, so it, it's just a matter of that. That might be a things like that are, are something to look at. I think in program right. development. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Uh, that's the end of my list. So thank you so much for spending this time with us today. We had a lot of questions. It's been a lot of time. So I uh, really, really appreciate you coming in. It was very enlightening. Cheers. Thank, thank you for so. having us. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, oh yeah. One thing we always ask, or I try to ask, is is uh, is rec any recommendations that you guys would like us to push for as a standing committee? Um, I know you reside within the department, but maybe there's things that you'd like us to put on our recommendation list that aren't getting the priority you think they deserve. I don't think that I have a, a priority necessarily, but um, you know, assistance in communicating what opportunities do exist now in early learning and childcare to to ensure that growth happens and that we're, in particular, I've heard several of you say which. I really appreciate. Um, I know Doreen does too, but um, the wage increase and how much that's meant to everyone. Um, I don't know how good of a job we do in bragging about the good stuff. And yes, there's still work to do. Yes, there's you know spaces to create and more humans to find to fill positions. But we we can't we can't we can't belittle or diminish the good that has happened. And and. And that needs to be part of the story that we're out there telling, because that's where we're going to recruit people, we're going to recruit providers. So with that message, we would appreciate your help. So our recommendation would be something like uh, funding to wrap up communications on what is being offered and what has been done. OK, we're going to take just a very quick uh, uh, break. I know I have to use the washroom. And we'll be right back. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Yeah.
back to order. Uh, we're at den item number four, um, new business. Is there any new business anybody wanted to bring forward? Okay, the clerk has a, a report on some of the work she's been doing to try and uh, schedule in the, the meetings between now and the next sitting. Um, the previous priority that was identified was having the ECDA in. Um, just with our limited availability, they don't have the time in their schedule. Um, they've got some conflicts, um, so they have offered to provide a written submission if the committee has specific questions that they'd like to answer. Um, but I understand that committee members might not have their questions prepared right now, so if you'd like to submit them to me, I kind of spoke to the chair about potentially drafting the letter and circulating it to members to approve of, sign off of, make sure it reflects everything that the committee wishes to to have um, feedback on. What do people think? All in agreement? Carla? Just, just, I'm, I'm, I know why we were calling them in, but was there a specific, what was our specific reason? Do you remember? Like, it was the child care registry as a whole, because they currently operate it, but there wasn't a necessary, like, specific ask. It was just kind of a briefing on the topic of the child care registry. Yeah. Uh, Robbie? How, how about just the question is, uh, you know, give us an update on the registry and how you feel, how they feel that they could make it more reflective of uh, accuracy and uh, versatility. Uh, you know, if they could get, get their opinion or do they think it's perfect the way it is, well, I guess that <laughs> answers that question. And how, how can it be improved? To, to more accurately reflect the needs of uh, children and required early child care services. Yep. Gord. And um, in the August 7th, 2023, um, the technical error in reporting, we never got the actual number. And what, what, what technical error was, was that? And um, is there any more in, in these numbers? Good point. Mm -hmm. that was Susie? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> so I just thought she did mention um, what the error was of that there was a duplication. Did she not say that when she presented that there was a duplication in the um, numbers and so when they ran them through again, they pulled the duplications out and the numbers came down? Is that, is that the error that you were talking about? I think that was something different. Okay. I don't sorry. think she went into detail. If my memory serves me correctly, she didn't go into detail okay. on that one. Sorry. Okay. We didn't get the real numbers, so. Okay. I'm okay. Sorry. So like but I mean, it's, I heard duplication a few times there, so I can't remember. We, we could possibly just ask them what their priorities are as an early childhood development association. Then we can see whether their priorities are lining up with what mm, government's yeah. doing, or we could recommend government follow their priorities if we want to. Gord? And do they feel that is, is, the, is the registry working efficiently for Islanders right now, into the, now and into the future? Like, are we, are we on the right track? Do we need to look at revamping this? Maybe they'll say they want government to take it over. Okay, uh, so you're going to do up a letter, mm -hmm. circulate it, we'll have a chance for feedback. Thank you very much, mm -hmm. as usual. Um, and you've been working on scheduling, so what do you say? Oh, uh, yes, yeah, so Mary Poppins is willing to come in uh, next week, so I'm just working to see if I can no, maybe... she personally. Um, there's three, no, not, not Mary Poppins, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's <laughs> Peter Pan's coming to Big state committee on the road. We'll go Fairy there. tale seed yeah. rolling. Yeah. <laughs> there's uh, three representatives. I don't have their names off the top of my head, um, but no. Fairy tales and flamingos. <laughs> and yes. um, just working to see if I can fit in some other centers, but they might be more um, open to a written submission. But we'll definitely at least have um, that group in. And then the following week is the CTA briefing on the 13th. All right. Any <clears throat> new bu further new business? A motion for adjournment? So moved. All right. Adjourned.